to the podcast where we bring on remarkable people to tell their stories. I'm Paul Gilman. I'm Daniel Lance. And this is Pod So One. Dale Fickett is the president and co-founder of RVA Works, a Richmond-based nonprofit that equips aspiring entrepreneurs with the knowledge and tools they need to start businesses. Dale was traveling Europe as a management consultant, making bank when he had an epiphany that ended up redirecting his whole career toward nonprofits. Dale tells us about the epiphany that he had and shares some data and success stories that RVA Works has been a part of since. We also discuss the effects COVID and tech dominance are having on entrepreneurship and whether optimism is justified. So here's Dale. Dale, welcome to Podso One. What's going on? Thank you. It's really great to be here with you guys. This is like take two, so I'm excited. It is take two. We actually, we tried this a while ago, uh, early, early, early stage, right. and um, we wanted to get you back on to, to get it right this time. So um, you are the president and co-founder of RVA Works, a yeah. nonprofit here in Richmond. Uh, tell us about RVA Works. So RVA Works is a public charity in Virginia, and, um, you know, so tax exempt status we have a mission to help more people become business owners so to me it's really straightforward um you know there's a lot of people who need help starting a business and we love it when we're able to help people particularly from lower income families because that provides them a livelihood Uh, it helps create jobs in neighborhoods that need it the most and then you know in the long run uh, we're seeing correlation between new business formation and poverty alleviation, so that's a great thing. Um, I think when you strengthen a family, you start strengthening communities, that's uh, a win-win kind of all around. So what are some of the ways that you uh, help form with with new business formation, with entrepreneurs, low-income families? Right, well, you know, um, we provide a lot of different support services. So most people know us because of our core training program, so we take people through a 12-week curriculum, People meet weekly, they have to come to us with an idea, it has to be feasible, we have to see that they're in a set of life circumstances where they can actually launch a business, and then we provide them a a tool set so that they can do that. And then, kind of wrapped around that are some pro bono services. We also make a lot of referrals for people. We um, also have a great group that we're a part of, a national group called One Million Cups, and that's all about helping people start new businesses and that's a um, you know the ethos is very closely connected to that um, you know to our work because it's all about inclusion diversity building connections not just networking for the state sake of exchanging business cards but it's about people making presentations not pitches and learning from each other so those are some of the things we do we have an alumni forum that meets we have um, oh gosh trying to think now there's um, the weekly calls that we do on Thursdays so we've been doing free public kind of information sessions on small business topics as it relates to what's going on in the economy what's happening in the markets and then what does that mean for small business owners cool is it safe to say that RVA works has a pretty special focus on low-income families and, and people of low income or can really anybody apply to these programs that you have yeah so so we we started from a very simple place but it's a very important place which is all about love and service so from my heart for faith i think that's the natural starting point for the conversation is why do you do all this and so um, i I see that it's incredibly important to reflect our values in the work that we do both in our families in our professions in our communities in our civic engagement And so I'm looking at myself and saying, well, you know, what is it that I'm bringing to the table that's of most use? What is the thing on the future that's the best possible scenario I can imagine as my orientation point? And as I'm headed toward that, what can I do in order to bring that about? And so I just happened to know some things about economics, finance and business strategy and said, well, this is a great way to help people start these businesses. So that's kind of the start of it. And so we've always had a preference for helping people from low income households, Mm -hmm. because when you strengthen a low income household, you essentially help children. Um, There's a lot of research that shows 
that you also help in terms of their educational attainment. Increases in income mean that people are able to pay for medicine. They're able to pay for rent. They're able to, um, you know, oftentimes get to a point where that business, uh, you know, if it grows and is strong enough, that it makes a difference in terms of generational asset inequality, which is something that is a little bit harder to address than income inequality. And in income inequality is hard enough, right? But when we look at workforce development initiatives to get people into good, solid career tracks, that's really important to do. Um, at the end of that career, that person may have accumulated a 401k and so forth, but it's not exactly the same thing as owning a business where one can hand that down to uh, subsequent generations. I see. So having just a 401k, like, like wealth versus having a, a real true asset, like a business or property or something that you can generationally perpetuate. Yeah. yeah and, I, and, and I think that, you know, for example, if someone has a family business, and I was just reading some research earlier today that one in four entrepreneurs in America right now is an immigrant, right? Um, which is kind of a big number, right? 25%, yeah, huge. right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and so there are so many stories in my family and many people that I talk to, many families, um, regardless of the part of the world that the folks came from, that starting a family business was really how they uh, maintained their livelihood, right? I mean, and so... The idea of having a family business where multiple people can work and earn their livelihood is in some ways um, better and can be more stabilizing for a family than one person earning a graduate degree and earning a higher income. Yeah, it reminds me of uh, Korean immigrants that came to California and they came with nothing. Uh, I don't know exactly when, sometime in the 20th century. And they'd put all their life savings into this small convenience store. And the first generation immigrants would work day in, day out, 24 seven. They wouldn't sleep. They would sleep at the store. That store would be their life. And, they, and that would provide for their children. And then they turned it around and invested in their children's education. And uh, you know, the store is one thing, but the education of the children allowed them to become more remuner remuneratively successful than their parents. And then you saw this classic American dream type, the next generation is more successful than the, than the last. Mm, mm -hmm. But um, I, re I really love the purity of, 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 and the optimism of I think what RVA Works' main thrust is, which is given an, an individual, they may have been deprived due to inequity or an injustice, if they have the right services, the right network, the right access to capital, and the right idea, anybody can start a business and provide for themselves and their family. Yeah, I mean, a amen, right? We're a country of immigrants. We're a country of people who are incredibly innovative, diligent, um, you know, all men created equal. We've grown an incredibly prosperous society as a result of that ingenuity and that fortitude. And um, I, I think, you know, all of us are blessed to be standing on the shoulders of giants in lots of ways. And so, you know, the, the question is, at least for me, is for our sisters and brothers who most need the help, what can we do that helps them play a part in and to feel a part of the American dream of owning a home and owning a business? And I would say that there's, I mean, you know, I've traveled around the world. I've seen a lot of different places. I'm sure there's a lot of opportunity in other places, but I'm still convinced that America is great in terms of having um, the ability to talk about the art of the possible and then to start a business and to actually have other people circle around that and to buy into that vision. And so we have a unique culture in that way because we're so heterogeneous. And I think that, you know, if we look at some of the pockets of low income communities, it's really popular right now to talk about what's happening in terms of inner cities because we have this whole backdrop of the George Floyd case, what's happened in terms of his murder and the um, and and the issue surrounding that, um, and and when you when you look at that and you look at the social unrest and you say, well, you know, why is this going on? And I think, you know, we have this dichotomy with two things that are really true about America, but that are very difficult to reconcile. And so, on the one hand, 
you have a group of people who are descended from slaves, people who came here in chains, who um, suffered at the hands of people who were, you know, who had brought them here. All of the injustice of slavery, the Civil War, people dying to defend that institution, the Reconstruction era, and through, you know, <clears throat> tobacco, the Civil Rights Movement, the Southern Freedom Movement. So you have that whole backdrop of an intergenerational perception of injustice. And then you have the counterpoints of many African American people who have done well, very well, you know, in our system, um, in a, a free enterprise system. And that's and so you have that truth of, you know, gosh, we have some work to do in terms of pathways of opportunity. And then you have another truth, which is me and my family came here from another country and worked really hard to get where we are and we did it because we were gritty and we were determined and we had fortitude and we did it and we made it happen. And so I think both of those things are true and it's very difficult to reconcile the, those two truths. And so I think that's what we're seeing play out in terms of the political dynamic. Right, I think if you, if you just focus on the latter, which is people who came from nothing or descended from slaves but have now become hugely successful, you'll get accused pretty quickly of ignoring all of these other inequities that exist in the country. Yeah. So. Yeah, and I think, you know, um, and, and not to get kind of too political about it, but I think that a lot of times when I hear people talk about issues around racial equity, what it, what mostly what they're really talking about are economic factors. And I'm always quick to say, yes, that's true disproportionately, if you happen to be African American or Latino in our country, disproportionately, you're more likely to live in a single parent household, you're more likely to be incarcerated, you're more likely to be victim of violent crime, you're more likely to go to prison, you're more likely to be a part of the recidivism cycle. Um, and at the same time, the vast majority of people who live in poverty in our country are Caucasian. And a lot of the times when people are talking about issues of and and rightly talking about those racial issues there's also another truth which is about white rural poor america mm -hmm. like the appalachian definitely people. yeah yeah well let's pivot hard here a little bit um you talked about ingenuity and innovation and that's one of the things that makes um you know our, our culture and our country pretty great um how has rva works been innovating through this unprece unprecedented time of, of lockdowns and businesses having to close because of COVID-19? Yeah, so I think probably the easy thing that we could have done was hit the pause button and say, well, we'll just wait and see. But we didn't do that. Back in March, pretty quickly, we looked at the situation and said, all right, number one, we can't meet in person. Um, so our classes cannot meet in person. Our one million cup sessions cannot meet in person. What can we do and what's going to be helpful? Because we know that small businesses are going to be hurting. And as soon as this came in, we said, all right, we're moving over to Zoom meetings. So that, that was kind of one. Um, we had decided to partner up a little bit with the one million cups in Raleigh, Durham. So we were pointing people over to, to the RTP. Um, so that's Research Triangle Park. Um, you know, so we were um, kind of helping to promote that particular online event and we said you know in this particularly unprecedented time what can we do that's going to be most meaningful and most impactful for small business owners a lot of our alumni but also people who have started up a small business and may have never even ever been to an rva works anything and so we started highlighting a lot of the issues that were coming up we and and we started a, a free public meeting series at noon eastern on Thursdays, and so we've continued that, and we've covered things, um, you know, like the Paycheck Protection Program. We've had speakers come in talking about cash budgeting, other sources of capital, crowdfunding. We've covered um, a lot of different topics which are relevant for small business owners. And then the other thing that we did, we now are taking applications in for our August cohort, so that will be delivered entirely on Zoom, and then. Um, you know, uh, the other thing is that we have an alumni forum that's ongoing, that's meeting on Zoom, all of our board meetings are meeting on Zoom, um, and then we've continued in terms of our grant pipeline and our funding pipeline to continue our operations because somebody needs to pay the bills around here. <laughs> oh, yeah. Do you find that it's as effective uh, uh, compared to pre-pandemic times? Well, 
I think that there's uh, two different sides to the coin, Paul. So I think on the one hand, we have um, the value in the fact that people are able to access our programming without physically being in Richmond. And I think that's pretty cool. And we've had people call in from other states, and that's really exciting. Um, the other thing, and internationally, um, and then the other thing that uh, comes to mind is that as valuable as that is, um, and as an organization, that's really attractive, right? Because it's, hey, how do we grow you know, out of the nest of Richmond into helping other people in other places? And I think that's super exciting. On the other hand, um, I'm also convinced that building trust-based relationships and authenticity happens in person when people not only hear the voice, they, they don't, you know, it's not necessarily just the facial expression, but there's something really important about being face-to-face -face with folks. I agree with that. Totally agree. And that's been a challenge, right? You, you can't yeah. connect in that way. Yeah, that's right. And those connections yeah. tend to be deeper for sure. Yeah. So have you always had this mindset of community service, helping the people that are maybe less fortunate, giving them opportunities? Or was there a, an epiphany at some point in your, your working life? Yeah, there. so there was an epiphany moment. Um, so back in, I, and I love this question. Thanks for asking it. <laughs> Um, there was an epiphany point. So, uh, so, so growing up, I'm, I'm a Jersey guy, um, you know, um, and, and I went to college in Philly and grad school up in the Delaware Valley, you know, and so I, um, and I have to give my shout out for LaSalle and for Villanova. Um, but you know, when I was, um, but when I was earlier in my career, when I started a company, when I was doing some consulting work, when when I was really kind of cutting my teeth, so to speak, in the professional world, I was essentially focused on getting ahead and getting um, essentially what I wanted and my idea of what happiness would be and to pursue that as much as I could. And I was taught as a youth and as a child, um, and it's just kind of the ethos that I was raised within was, um, you know, it's up to you, right? It's self-reliance. You need to define what you want out of life and then you work harder, faster, longer, smarter, whatever it was, it's up to you. And I think a lot of people can resonate with that. I think a lot of people are raised in that sort of uh, philosophy. And so in 2006, at that time in my career, I was living over in Ireland, <clears throat> in Dublin, Ireland, and I was on the back of this bus um, going into my project assignment i was the program director for this it transformation one of um, ireland's large banks and so i'm on my way into work and it's one of those cold wet rainy days and um and and it's dark too right because at that time of year in dublin it doesn't get light out until later and so i was doing my homework because i was in the middle of becoming a roman catholic so i was, I was converting to Catholicism, a lot of people ask me like, why on earth would you ever do that? And it's kind of like a whole nother hour conversation. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I was, uh, but I, I was really drawn, um, drawn in. And um, so I'm having this passionate experience and um, kind of, and just loving every minute of it, loving what I'm learning. Um, and so, uh, you know, I was doing my homework and it hit me like um, just kind of like waves and waves of energy. It took me a long time to settle down, to catch my breath, to kind of, um, you know, I, I was walking into the, I, you know, I get off the bus, I'm walking into the office and I have to go into the men's room and, you know, and, and I'm just kind of like trying to compose myself. And it took me a while to really settle down from that. But I had read in the Catholic Catechism um, about the fact that our lives are oriented toward assistance for the poor. And it just hit me like a thunderbolt, you know, it was like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. And not because I want to, but just because in terms of objective reality and ultimate good and pursuing things that are beautiful and, and, you know, and true, that this is the way that my life should be oriented. And I should be doing things that are directed in this way. And that was in, yeah, that was in uh, like the winter of 2007 before I had actually gone through and, you know, um, kind of had um, my first Holy Communion as a Catholic. 
it's a cool story, right? Thank you. It's a really yeah, cool story. thank you. So that kind of changed everything, and then I started thinking differently about my work at Accenture. I became more involved with Accenture Development Partnerships. I was um, looking at any type of way that I could find to absorb information about how market economies can be used to help those that need it most. Mm. So uh, you had this revelation, do, uh, you know, relating to the fact that uh, the big part of your life should be helping the poor. Uh, and you called RVA Works a uh, charity, a public charity at the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, but it seems to be, it doesn't seem to just be giving people money or giving people food uh, in the way that I would typically think a charity would. Instead, it's it's more of like this, let's equip people with the skills to bootstrap themselves and to start their own businesses. Yeah. How did you come to uh, settle on that as opposed to just doing a, let's do a fundraising and food kitchen style charity or right. just a straight giving money type charity? Yeah, well, I, you know, I think that each of us has to go through that process of discernment to think, well, what do I have to offer? Right. What what if, if I think about the way that things could be out on the horizon um, and I'm aiming toward that and I'm saying it's really about helping my sisters and brothers so that they're strong enough themselves to help still others. What does that look like? What am I bringing to the table? Right. So I'm not a classic educator. You know, I didn't teach, you know, uh, high school. Right. Um, I'm, I'm not I'm certainly not a physician. Um, not able to provide legal aid, but I'm bringing this unique skill set, which is this combination of strategy consulting with Accenture, teaching at the Wharton School at Penn, realizing, and, and having started my own company, realizing that a lot of people have never had those experiences and never will, right? And saying, well, there's something really good about that and something very valuable about that, and how can that value be best directed toward that end? And so that was an ongoing discernment process. I began sucking up as much information as I could about things like impact investing, social entrepreneurship, um, started looking at a lot of economic development policy, started looking at, you know, ha um, thinking about social enterprise models and social impact bonds and pay for performance and, you know, all this different terminology that was totally new to me and getting acquainted with it. So I was at least conversant and then deciding, okay, what am I going to do with all this stuff? So mm. that ended up leading into some research with Trinity College Dublin, and that led into some work at Penn. And then I ended up in Richmond through another couple little twists and turns. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I, I certainly did not intend to start a nonprofit in Richmond when I first got here, but here we are. <laughs> yeah. 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 When I think of... Um... Oh, hang on a second. I just blanked on what I was going to ask. So while you're trying to get yeah get that back, uh, what's really cool about what you're doing, as opposed to and and I'm not this is not me throwing shade at uh, food banks and that sort of thing, but that that is solving an immediate need and and directly attacking it. Mm -hmm. What you are doing is generational and is empowering people to care for themselves and then push that out. And so the the multiplicative effect is fantastic in, in what you're doing. It's like teach a man a fish type stuff yeah. That's as opposed right. to giving him a fish. Yeah. Biblical baby. Yeah. I was raised Christian. <laughs> um, so, okay. I remember what I was going to say. You're one, excited about the biblical reference. I see. Okay. Yeah. My mom's going to be proud of that one. Yeah. Shout out to mom. Uh, one of the terms you threw out, I'm just going to pick one of them. Uh, impact investing. Sure. What is that? Um, well, before I address that, and I, and I am going to address that, but I have to, I have to also mention that a good friend of mine, um, you know, Dave Barrett is his name, and I'm going to be doing some some more work with him on the investing side. And and actually, he's he's someone who um, is a strong Christian. And he said, you know what I love about RVA Works? And I said, no, what? And he said, I love that this is like teach a man to fish ministry. This is so great because it's not about the immediate need, as important as that is, but it's also about this kind of long term impact. Um, for a family and for a community. Um, and uh, the other thing that you mentioned about impact investing. So what is impact investing? Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of people are familiar with, they have a 401k, they invest money into it, there's fixed income products, there's public equities, they might have a portion that's in commodities, people are used to investing in their real estate or even a second property where they're, you know, it's a rental property or what have you. 
But there is a movement increasingly significant in the investing world called impact investing. And so <clears throat> historically, there was something called socially responsible investing that still exists. And that's sort of the negative screens. So that's an investment fund that says we're not going to invest in firearms or tobacco or we're not going to invest in, um, you know, particular industries, other industries which um, provide some sort of to which people would have a moral objection. Impact investing goes a step further and says, we want to see a demonstrable, measurable, uh, net positive social benefit through this investment that's been made. And so across the whole range of asset classes, there are different organizations, uh, whether it's asset uh, owners, asset managers, and businesses that are utilizing that capital to prove number one we're profitable scalable we're earning returns on our investment and plus we're also providing this social benefit and so that could be in food um, agriculture that could be in water that could be in reducing pollution that could be mitigating some sort of other climate change issue um, around deforestation rising sea levels that could be involved with uh, reducing poverty uh, a lot of that work is international but um, you know, microfinance, as an example, is a large um, kind of segment of impact investing. Microfinance? Mm -hmm. Is that giving small loans to people? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So, yeah, it's, it's interesting because usually I hear of, uh, you know, either there are these nonprofits that don't really require business model and a, and a, a, to be profitable, um, or you have these startups that are aggressively chasing profitability and impressing investors at all costs. But to combine those two in one and say, in, investing in us not only will get you return on your money, but will also impact the world for better. That's a tall order. I mean, it seems like that kind of company is a lot harder to build. Yeah, I, I, I would totally agree. And I think in the world of entrepreneurship, and I was just having a conversation about this yesterday, I, I think we have to be really cautious about the terms that we use because they have really technical definitions but i think sometimes people use them without necessarily being 100 percent clear on what those definitions are and so you know it's almost like when we use a term we have to be cautious about what we're talking about i feel and like you're about to correct me on a no, term i used no 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 i'm, I'm here to learn from you and, um no, I, um, when, when someone says about social entrepreneurship, I'm always asking, so are you talking about a high growth, high tech innovator that's raising impact investing venture capital and delivering some scalable solution with um, a net positive social benefit and a competitive return on investment given the risk? Or... Or are you talking about a social enterprise that's a buy one, give one model or opportunity employment for former felons or some other type of model, public private partnership? Or are you talking about empowerment entrepreneurship where you're helping people in lower income households attract the sort of money and information and insight that they need to launch a business, regardless of what type of company they're starting, that the fact that they have built a company is beneficial for them. Um, and so I'm always kind of in my mind distinguishing those categories. I, I, I hope that's helpful. Yeah, no, that's super helpful. Um, before before we move away from uh, uh, RVA Works again, uh, can you just tell people how they can get involved? Either people who have an idea for a business or it is a nonprofit, so how to donate, yeah. how to get involved. Yeah, so the easiest way is to find us on rvaworks.org. Um, and, and people ask me all the time, Dale, how can I help? And I'd say, well, number one, if you know someone who's starting a business, point them our way. We'd love to talk with them. Uh, number two, if you are interested in providing some sort of mentorship or some sort of guidance or volunteerism, we'd love to talk with you. And also, and I get in trouble if I don't do this. So if you want to make a financial commitment to RVA Works, then we're happy to happy to uh, receive that as well. And, you know, that's the nice thing because we're a 501c3. It's all tax deductible. See, right. I, I get in trouble if I if I don't say that. My board of directors will say, Dale, you know, come on, man. You got and they're going to listen to this. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 right. <laughs> we, we hope. Yeah. They, they will. Yeah. yeah Most they of them will. will. They will. Anyway, they yeah, will. Yeah. yeah. So you have a relationship with the city of Richmond. Can you describe what that relationship is? Yeah, so um, overall, the public sector, um, 
I think it's fair to say the public sector is sort of on the back foot when it comes to entrepreneurship. And it's in lots of ways, it's not their fault because the people who tend to be in the public sector choose to be there for a reason and they're choosing not to go into business for a reason. And that's fine. And, there, and you know, I happen to have done different types of work and I think, and, and there are many people that I know who work in the public sector who are very able, intelligent, who do a lot of really good things. Um, with the city of Richmond, we started as a project of the Economic Development Authority. And when we started, we said, look, you know, here's this technology incubator that's kind of dated and old, and we need to do something that's new and innovative to reflect what Richmond really could be nationally. And so we rolled out a strategy around that. It took us eight months to pull that together and, um, you know, the reports and everything else. And so we got the blessing of the Secretary of Commerce and Trade. And so we got started uh, along that path. And one of the items was to establish a nonprofit so that we could also raise money from the private sector um, to support RVA Works programming. And in there, we said, well, you know, as, uh, as a region, as a kind of startup community or entrepreneurial ecosystem, whatever we want to call it, um, we need to have a way that entrepreneurs can navigate through all these different resources and provide, uh, provide them a, a good kind of referral point. And we said it's also really important that we have a destination type entrepreneur center where if you're coming to Richmond from another part of the country, that you say, well, that's the place I have to start my business because this is the type of business that I'm starting and this is the best thing going when it comes to this type of business. And so we laid out that whole strategy and you know, as administrations change, as boards of directors change, we were in a position where we said, okay, the best thing for us to do is to leave the Economic Development Authority and we were very fortunate at the time to spin out our nonprofit so we didn't have to just stop a program. We could spin out the nonprofit. We could keep our branding. Um, I was um, always a part of that nonprofit and we were able to continue our operations uninterrupted. Um, I'd love to tell you that the city of Richmond gives us a big check every year, but that's not true um, because in the city government, they have their Office of Community Wealth Building, Minority Business Development and others and they're performing their functions. And so the short answer is what we do today is very little officially with the city of Richmond. But um, we are hopeful that we'll have uh, some nice collaboration with them um, over the next year. We've just submitted a grant to measure um, at an academic level, um, doctoral level, uh, the poverty alleviating impact of our programming and specifically what that's meant for families and children in Richmond. Wow. Can you go into that a little bit? Sure. Um, so <clears throat> if we think about what, um, you know, if, if we think about all of this work to help people start new businesses, I mean, that's great, but, it, but a huge part of this sort of nonprofit social impact, charitable work, whatever we want to call it, a huge part of that is monitoring and evaluation, right? So how are we doing around here, right? right. Yep. And um, I mean, I could tell you a dozen stories about different entrepreneurs who have come through our program who are great examples of, um, of, of the work that we do and the fact that they're launching, they, that they have launched their business, that they're operating these businesses. But I think that there comes a point in time where one needs to say, um, you know, as a whole, if we're to be as, if, if we're to hold up as much scrutiny as possible, and, and if we're to say as critically as possible, is a dollar that goes into RVA works as good as a dollar that goes into fill in the blank, right? And so in 2017, we did a survey of our graduates at that time and just to give you an idea, 58% were from lower income households, 70% were women founders, 97% are ethnic minorities. And um, so we're reaching folks that we want to help. Um, and then we looked at, well, you know, what's happening there? And so 
about 25% of the people who come into the program don't complete it because they realize for some reason they're not going to start a business and that's okay. Um, the people who do complete it, two thirds start their company. And when they do, we've, we see based on the income that people reported that there was an increase and the average increase was about 38% annually. Now, a 38% increase, as you know, if all of a sudden you got a 38% raise, that's a pretty big deal, right? So the, all the two-thirds people that started their business, the average across that section was was 38%. Right. Were there, so some must have been very successful and some, I imagine, even after going through the program, like how many didn't work out? Yeah, so um, it, it's interesting because of those, so of those people who finished, two-thirds started Mm -hmm. and then you know and then there was another um i mean it was a very high percentage i think it was 25 percent um but i can you know get you the report but there was another 25 percent so very few who finished the program said i'll never start this business right once they completed the program less than 10 percent for sure less than 10 percent said i'm never going to do this Mm -hmm. and the other 25 percent said at that time i plan to start this business in Mm -hmm. the next six months so there was a commitment to continuing on with it. And so the reason that I mention all that is because those data points are really valuable, right? I mean, the the anecdotal stories and the success stories and the emotive response that one has for alumni that are doing this is really important, but it's as important to look at the numbers. Yep. So with all that being said, um, and I kind of alluded to this before, I've done some academic research. And when I was looking at this and people were saying, well, you know, gee, how would we really do a good job at evaluating this program? And ultimately, it's about the extent to which you are contributing to the alleviation of poverty. Mm. And um, so we have a doctoral student from VCU at the Wilder School, first African-American governor of Virginia. Um, And so- First in the country. Oh, is that right? Oh, thank you, Paul. Okay, I didn't realize that. Oh, okay. Yep, So, um, so Sambo Chunda, is from Zambia originally. She's a former fellow at Oxford and she happens to be here in Richmond. And so she's gotten started working with us. And uh, actually she just had a conference last week and I spoke for her uh, on access to capital. And we had, I think it was uh, close to a thousand people from all over the world, kind of, you know, different, a lot of women entrepreneurs, but just, you know, men as well. Nice. Yeah, it was awesome. Um, and so, she came to me saying, hey, you know, I'm going to do a dissertation. I want to work with my faculty advisor um, at VCU. And, uh, you know, would you do this research with me? And so I said, sure, I'd love to. We got to get some funding to do it, but let's do it. And so we started down that path and started structuring a research, uh, you know, a research project that would essentially be um, at the level of academic rigor where one could and we will um, publish a peer reviewed journal article. Wow. Very cool. And hopefully the media will pick that up and turn it into a really enticing story that will then go to change minds. Cause I think that having data and having numbers, you're right, is the right way to go about it and to prove it out in a logical way. But I think convincing people is another convincing people like RVA works is a good idea. Your dollar is best used at RVA works. Um, that's a little bit more of a human psychological play that definitely. you have to figure out. Yeah, that's definitely right. And and I think that that's, you know, it's kind of like, you know, a, a, a multi-tiered, multi-front, like, you know, long-term process, right? Right, right. Because it's the anecdotal stories. It's the policy discussions. The emotional stuff. Yeah. yeah, it's like, you know, the presentations like this, just, you know, awareness stuff. It's kind of having an input in terms of policy. But then it's also about those hard numbers when someone is you know, kind of like really drilling down into it. And I, I happen to have that benefit of having done some academic work in the past to be able to say, well, look, you know, when, when we know what good looks like, then that's what we should shoot for. Right. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and we're already thinking ahead in terms of doing a longitudinal study that can be done over a longer period of time. But for right now, for the sake of this, uh, of this study, we're just going to look at, okay, if you look at the demographics of 
people in Richmond and you look at the demographics of people who have completed the training and you look at what happens to the general population versus what has happened for people who have completed the training for themselves as well as for the children in their households. And it's essentially a measure of what is the delta or what is the difference between the two. Mm. Yeah, and I think even those 25% of people that go through that feasibility uh, testing and the, and the program and decide, I'm not going to do this right now, there's an argument, there's an argument to be made that that's also um, a net benefit. You can't maybe turn it into hard dollars, but those people have come away with it with a much more practical um, set of tools and, and way of thinking about evaluating whatever business ideas that they come up. And, and you basically save them from throwing themselves into more debt from trying to start a, an idea that was infeasible from the, from the get-go. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. So I think of, you know, let's say that roughly 25% for those folks I think that having completed the program shows the fortitude and discipline to move ahead in terms of themselves, for their lives, for their families, for their careers. And as they're doing that, I mean, there's no shortage of companies that want entrepreneurial people, mm -hmm. right? So that's a benefit regardless, right? And I think that the attrition rate or the people who started the program and didn't complete it, for them, I, I also think that there's a positive side to that, which is for those folks, it could have been a micro loan that went bad. And I think right. that's what you're, you're talking about there, Daniel. And yeah, so you're saving them in the long run. Um, do you want to take a break and ask uh, Dale our the, questions? The, the, the one question? The podcast. Well, we have two questions. We tonight. have two questions yeah, tonight. Yeah, so I'll, I'll yeah. ask the standard one. All right, hit it. Uh, you're 25 years old in this scenario. You have no responsibilities other than yourself. You're not married, no kids. Uh, you have two opportunities. You can either join the United States military, serve four years, any branch of your choice, or you can do stand-up comedy for six months, writing and delivering every single week for those six months. Which would you choose? Um, so those are really interesting choices. Um, <laughs> so f for me... Um, and I'm, I'm going to answer this in a roundabout way. Um, when I was 17 and a senior in high school, I was recruited early for West Point and I gave up the opportunity to go. Wow. Uh, because of being an Eagle Scout and I yeah. had pretty decent grades and, you know, I was, um, you know, anyway, the point being that um, I, you know, could have gone down that route and I didn't, right? At the time, I was not encouraged to serve in the military. Um, at that point, I didn't know my father yet. Uh, my father and I, it's kind of side note, but my father and I didn't meet until I was 32 years old. And he's a Vietnam War veteran. He was, I was six weeks old when he went to Budapest, Thailand. He was there during the mass pullout. Oh, wow. And yeah. And so the answer is that I would serve in the military um, if I was 25 and had those options. Um, because it's one of the things that I look back now and I say, you know, my life would have gone in a very different direction had I done that. Um, and I regret having not done it yet. I can't totally regret the choices that I've made because it's been an incredible journey over the, you know, in this scenario, 25. So that would be 20 years ago for me. I'm 45. So over that last 20 years, when I think of all the experiences I've had, the places I've been and people I've met has been unbelievable. It's been a great blessing. But uh, yeah, in that scenario, I would um, I would enlist. Yeah. Cool. Love that. Is your epiphany, would your epiphany, do you think, have happened? The one when you were on the bus in Ireland? Um, mm, if you had been in the military as opposed to being a management consultant? That's an interesting question. Um, I would say that if I were... Um, I, I would say that if I were deployed and in a high stress environment, which is altogether likely, as you know, Paul, um, <clears throat> that um, that is altogether possible that that would have happened anyway, regardless. And I think, um, you know, just overall that God is always calling us to himself. Right. And so um, we're you know, um, I mean, it's, it's up to each of us, right? How open we want to be to that call. And some people want to kind of like do the hard stop. There was a long time where I felt I had it all figured out. I got it covered. I had God on the back burner and, um, you know, and I mean, fortunately, 
um, there came about this set of circumstances where I said, you know what, um, I, I want to grow in my faith. I want to have a stronger, um, I, I want to have a stronger relationship with him and I want to, um, to grow in that way. Mm. And so I imagine that other circumstances would have come up to bring that about. He, he would have done his work somehow or the other. He mm. always does. Mm -hmm. yeah, and practically, if you had found yourself overseas in an impoverished place, you may have had the epiphany sooner. Yeah. Potentially. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. And I, it, I would be remiss if I didn't let our listening audience know there are three of us, if you haven't figured that out yet. And I'm the only one who's not an Eagle Scout. <laughs> hey -oh. <laughs> Be prepared. Be do you, prepared. Do you still remember the Scout Law? Um. Oh gosh! It's, it starts with the scout. Trustworthy, it's trustworthy, loyal, helpful, um, friendly, friendly, courteous, kind, kind obedient, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, thrifty brave, brave, clean, clean and, and reverent. reverent. I see. Yes, yeah. I remember you, part of it. Once you get going, yeah, it all comes right. out. That's right. Uh, um, I won't. I won't test you on the scout oath <laughs> or the outdoor code. Um, <laughs> but uh, our, the second question. But I think this is our inaugural version of it, but I'd like to start asking it of our, of our guests is what is a habit that you've enacted that you think has made a meaningful difference in your life? Um, yeah, the probably the biggest thing is, is bringing my Philadelphia Eagles ficket cup everywhere with me now. I'm just, just kidding. I had to, I had to, I had to give a shout out to my Philadelphia Eagles. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Reminder that the football season hopefully is about to Hopefully, away. hopefully. Yeah. yeah. Um, Probably the game changer for me over the last few years. Um, well, one thing was I stopped drinking alcohol. Um, as I did that, I uh, grew in terms of my relationship with God. Um, those two things kind of happened kind of in parallel. Um, but my spiritual journey, you know, is kind of closely connected to that. And at the same time, um, you know, I grew in terms of. A practice of essentially self-evaluation and meditation so I could tell you about oh this is what I do with nutrition and exercise whatever I mean I do have practices with that but you know I think a lot of people do but I think that one of the biggest things that I've learned over the last few years is how important self-reflection self-examination having strong spiritual advisors that have that you've given the permission to speak into your life um, to check yourself if, you know, do I have this right? Am I seeing this correctly? Because mm -hmm. we have the wrong pair of glasses sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, all of us. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and I think that meditation brings about a, a great deal of insight that we wouldn't have otherwise. And when do you meditate? Oh, when I first get up, because I get, you know, like I'm kind of a high energy guy, right? I'm, I, I was talking, oh, yeah. with a, I was talking with a friend of mine. And he said, uh, he said, yeah, you know, Dale, um, you know, sometimes you're a little bit difficult to approach. Hmm. And I said, really? Because I'm thinking like, what are you talking about? I'm friendly and, you know, I, I mean, I try to be humble, you know, I like actually try to be kind to people. And um, I said, well, you know, you're like kind of a big guy and then you're extroverted and, you know, you're expressive and, you know, it's like whenever I'm with you, I'm thinking, gee, I really don't want him to get angry with me. And I'm thinking like, wow, that's, wow. I never thought about myself that way, you know, but, yeah. um, but, but anyway, um, yeah. So I, I, I have to do that sort of meditation first thing in the morning when I first get up, it's like 20, 30 minutes. That's when my kind of natural, um, kind of juices haven't like really started getting going. And so that's the time when I can sit down usually outside. We're here in Virginia. So that's mm -hmm. usually about eight months out of the year that I'm outside. And, um, there's probably an argument to be made to do it in the winter too, but I haven't gone, there. I haven't mm. gone, I haven't gone there yet. That's kind of a little bit more Spartan. Kind of like the argument for taking cold showers every morning. You know what? I'm, it's funny you brought that up, Daniel, because there's a group of guys. Are you familiar with Exodus 90? Uh, do, they, do they take cold showers together? Have, do, together well, no, no. <laughs> together no okay. okay it's a cold shower enthusiast group i take cold showers every morning do you yep every morning I, i'm sorry what, what's the benefit of the cold shower versus a warm uh, shower i read it in an article once but i think there's sleep uh stress immune system associated benefits because basically and it's also a reset button on my brain so if i wake up 
and I've got a lot of anxiety running through my head. Uh -huh. I get into a cold shower and nothing else matters in the world when I'm like freezing and the water is covering my body. Right. And I walk, I get out of the shower and it's like a reset button was hit on my brain. I've heard that about the bench press too. Mm. If you have a lot of weight over your face, you don't think about a lot else. Right? Yeah, it's sort of a meditation in its own right, <laughs> right? You can't really focus on anything else. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, that, well, so that the Exodus 90 is a group and I'm, I, and I'm like, I haven't done this yet. Right. So I was just invited to do this. And um, so there's a whole bunch of different things that are, that I, I think, most of it I'm doing already. So it's things like, you know, reading scripture, prayer and meditation time, service for others, um, rigorous exercise, avoiding the sweets. It's mm. kind of a combination of spiritual disciplines and physical austerity. What's umbrella. Mm. Um, but one of the things is cold showers. You know, you like kind of for 90 days, you commit to the fact yeah, maybe I should have started this in June, you know, June, yeah. July, August. Maybe May, yeah. late May. It's, yeah. It's, yeah, right. It's less fun in the winter when the pipes are, are cold. I'll tell you that. That's very cool. Um, and one thing you mentioned, you know, giving up alcohol. Yeah. I'm, I'm going on two years sober now. Oh, good and for I you. think that I think that giving up alcohol is sort of a gateway. Um, you know, it's not a habit. It's a negative habit. It's like not drinking. Um but it's sort of a gateway to more introspection and more setting up habits and discipline and, and uh, you know, improving yourself in other ways, be it through nutrition or exercise or totally. engaging in meditative practices. It sort of like unlocks – I've, I've, my experience has been that it's unlocked some more of my potential. Um, you know, instead of drinking, you know, four or five beers in a night, I'm sure. like – I'm doing something – are more productive or more meaningful with my time like, yeah like this podcast like this yeah i thought you were going to say stopping drinking was a gateway to cold showers <laughs> I, weird like, I don't know if yeah it's i don't know if i would be taking cold showers if i was still drinking you know I, nobody wants to take a cold shower when they wake up hungover right but for me it's like clockwork every morning just jump in the cold shower yeah i've been i've been sober now for 10 years Wow. wow. Congratulations. Yeah. That's thank you. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. I mean, it's like I, I tell people the strongest thing I have now is like a cup of coffee or Tylenol. <laughs> wow. That's, That's it. Right. Yeah. That's about it. I love that. And and I, I totally agree, by the way, that I think that there's something very countercultural about the idea of self-control. I, 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 th there's almost like this um, idea that you should be able to do whatever you want, whenever you want, with whomever you want, and you yourself determine what's good and true. And, you know, and there's no objective measure to decide where could I improve or how could I be better? And, uh, you know, notwithstanding all the self-help stuff, I think that there's something, um, something very powerful about that idea of intentional discipline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's I've I've heard that the, that same dichotomy um, described as short-term pleasure versus long-term freedom. Mm. And people like Jocko Willink say, you know, he's famous for saying discipline equals freedom. Mm. Uh, he's a he's a Navy SEAL, okay. and it's like this paradoxical sounding phrase. But if you discipline yourself in the short term and you neglect your immediate desires and immediate wants in favor of these. Uh, more like greater long-term goals then you you like paradoxically become more free yeah you get stronger right yep. it's um and you know we could say the same thing about the pursuit of romantic relationship right i mean if you're constantly in the cycle of i must have i need i want and you're kind of constantly spinning in that cycle where it's controlling you as opposed to you kind of reflecting and saying these are the things that i want in my life and this is what I'm willing to wait for. And then therefore my yes means something as opposed to, well, it's always yes because it's Saturday night. Right, right, right. right. It's five o'clock somewhere, yeah. <laughs> um, so pivoting to, uh, uh, this is a, a, another kind of broad question with regard to entrepreneurship and okay. the future of it. So okay. we are in um, this kind of weird time where uh, two things are happening. Uh, one is, a lot of small businesses cannot withstand the financial pressure from the lockdown from COVID uh, and are closing, some, sometimes permanently. 
And then at the same time, we are in the middle of the what's being called the fourth industrial revolution, which is uh, the automation revolution of, um, you know, these technology companies automating jobs that used to be common for, uh, you know, minimum wage or, or blue collar workers. So things like uh, retail, um, you know, grocery self checkout things where you just scan the things yourself. Uh, McDonald's, you just go up to the kiosk and push the buttons and they don't need someone at the cashier anymore. Uh, self driving trucks, you know, dr truck driving is a huge, huge uh, industry. It's the most common job in 29 states um, and it's about to be automated by a select few mm -hmm. Silicon Valley, you know, smart companies. So we have this world, the, the, the picture I'm painting is like, a lot of jobs, a lot of common labor jobs are being automated away. And a lot of small businesses are being, you know, arguably prematurely uh, closed because of the, the lockdowns. So it's hard not to be pessimistic looking at that. Um, and I'm wondering, are you pessimistic or optimistic? And, and what do you think uh, is the future of entrepreneurship in this reality that we are entering? So the, I, I just want to make sure I got the question. By the way, I was talking with my aunt before I came in for this interview. This is my mother's sister. And she said, oh, yeah, this will be some cupcake interview. You know, it's like not hardball. I mean, you're not in like crossfire. You know? and, and then I got this question. Right. Like, this was like, it was cupcake until yeah, this. Until yeah. No, no, it's cool, though. But um, oh, so, so, so the factors were um, automation. You were talking about automation mm -hmm. and the impact that that could have for unemployment rates. I think right a lot something. a lot of traditional work, right. um, retail, uh, food service, truck driving is is being automated, and and those jobs are not coming back. Right, and so the question is, what will the future of entrepreneurship look like? Right, I mean, people that can't find work that way, um, and I want to start their own businesses in this world of of automation. Mm -hmm. uh, what what does that look like to you? Yeah, that's um, so. So that's a great question, and um, so I, I would break it down like this: that as you already pointed out, that there are factors that are impacting the economy. So entrepreneurship is always a a function of and an activity within the broader economic context, which is also part of the political context, which is part of the legal context, right? Which is a part of the social context. And so when I think of, well, what's happening in terms of the main changes, I, I would say the one you hit on around automation is super important. I would also say that we've seen this rise of nationalism and populism, not just in the United States, but in a lot of other countries. Um, I would say that the political dynamic, which has become much less about multilateralism and much more about individual countries, is going to play a significant role in terms of what happens with trade. We've already seen a pullback in terms of foreign direct investment. That was happening before the pandemic, by the way. It's been exacerbated by the pandemic. We've also seen a flattening in terms of traded goods. And so um, at the same time, cross-border data flows have grown exponentially. And so I think that, um, you know, that to me kind of leads into what are the major contours that are changing around the economy? And then from those things, what does that mean for new business formation? So I'm going to think out loud a little bit on yeah, that. Go for it. Um, so I would say that one of the big contour changes is about the social contract. Um, there was a time where if you worked in a company for a particular length of period, that that company would make sure that you were okay in your retirement, right? That portion of the social contract is gone. We know that we're in the gig economy. And that's not only true in the United States, that's happening across many developed countries. Um, so there's a lot of questions about social consciousness and how do we help people and families be more resilient. So I think that's kind of one thing that's out there that's a big question about, you know, what role could entrepreneurship play in that? Um, I think the second part is climate change, right? So climate change is something which, um, you know, in the United States here, it's still a bit of a political football. But when we look at this kind of nationalistic pullback 
from multilateralism, I think the net negative for all of us are some of the global issues, things like climate change, things like south to north migration. We think of it in terms of Mexicans, Guatemalans, other people from Latin America coming north. In Europe, it's much more about people from the Middle East and North Africa coming north, right? Um, so I think, you know, that that um, kind of huge shift um, is it is a societal challenge that we're, that we're up against. And um, also what comes to mind are the sustainable development goals, right? So we have those 17 goals that have been listed out and internationally, what would we do to help have a more sustainable planet and a more sustainable society? Uh, and then I think we also have um, this um, kind of hyper-connectedness, right? Um, in, in new ways, we're able to connect with each other in ways that were never possible before. I mean, the fact that I was talking with a thousand entrepreneurs by presenting my topic yeah. and that a lot of them are in Africa is kind of mind boggling, right? It was yeah. only a few years ago. It's totally impossible for that to happen. And so, um, so, so what does all that mean? I, I think in terms of entrepreneurship, we in the United States have had a, a kind of this period of flattening of new business formation. And that's, I think, almost it has to increase because people need to earn a livelihood. So as automation rolls through the economy, I think that you're right that a lot of those larger companies will start um, essentially layoffs more layoffs, that there will be less hiring, more of it will be 1099 and so forth. Um, for those who aren't in the United States, 1099, independent independent contractor, right? So it's not a full-time term full -time hire. Yeah, we're international. You're international, yeah. man. You're international. Yeah, we've had at least like 30 downloads international. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, definitely, yeah. Definitely in Anglophone countries, right? Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, um, so, so I, I would say that... Um, there is an idea, and I think that, and, and this is where I find my hope, is that as people are responding to the degree of our connectedness, that there are ways to form businesses which leverage that connectedness, that are able to take advantage of the diaspora connections, right? The immigration connections from one country to another that are able to, to continue to find gaps in terms of market spaces because the overall dynamic of large companies is not new. And there's a reason why industrial era companies had, you know, there were trust busters, right? And so I think we're at that point where there are some really important political discussions being had around data security, privacy, uh, things like net neutrality. And as we look at those issues, um, I think some of those uh, companies in terms of some of the activities they're undertaking might be subject to antitrust um, legislation or regulation. Mm -hmm. And then I would also say that there will, will continue to be different pockets of opportunity. That's where my hope is, that there will be different pockets of opportunity leveraging the hyper-connectedness. And I think um, a lot of that will, in my mind, hopefully be connected to not just moving, um, you know, um, data around mm -hmm. networks and not just moving finances around networks. I think that'll be part of it. But hopefully um, that the people who are building those companies are really conscious of the products and services that they're delivering and that those products and services are also a net positive for mm -hmm. communities. Okay. So then to kind of distill it, are you optimistic that there are enough of these pockets and opportunities for new businesses for, let's just say America, all the people in our country to um, survive and thrive in, uh, in, our, in our capitalist uh, framework? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that there are, um, that, that the answer is yes. And the okay. reason that I would say that is when we think of the types of small businesses, let's just take RVA Works as a microcosm. Mm -hmm. So Richmond, Virginia, um, 
you know, for the international audience. In <laughs> the we're, we're, we're big in Spain and the Netherlands. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, oh, so, you know, <clears throat> mid, <laughs> mid Atlantic coast. Um, so, um, but you know, uh, but, but if we take RVA works as a microcosm, what are the types of businesses that are coming? Right. Um, well, certainly there's a lot of food businesses, right? Food trucks and local restaurants aren't going anywhere. Mm-hmm. And I was having this conversation with my brother um, about dollar stores. You know, Amazon is disrupting retail. I would hate to be in commercial retail right now, right? Mm. Not only not only restaurants that are under pressure, you know, distressed property, but then you also have this whole dynamic with... Um, retail generally right mm-hmm. shopping centers which are going to look and feel more like entertainment it's like a day out to do something as opposed to i need this list and i have to go right. get it um, and then commercial real estate in terms of offices you know now we're learning more about work from home right so um so when i think of those opportunities that small businesses are pursuing Food businesses aren't going anywhere. Construction and trade-based businesses, right? We have a lot of people who come to us that are painters, carpenters, they're bricklayers, right? They're, Mm -hmm. um, you know, HVAC, right? So those businesses aren't going anywhere. Landscaping, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Then I think of people who, we have a lot of people who are home health care, right? Those sort of services for elder care, that's not going anywhere, particularly in terms of the aging demographic here in the U.S., but that's also true in Europe as well. Although the healthcare system there is structured differently, but, you know, but I I don't think that's going anywhere. Yeah. Being any kind of like emotional provider, human, human to human provider, or even doing things like plumbing, HVAC, landscaping, those are all very difficult to automate. I mean, it took, it took a while to get trucks to the point where they could drive themselves, but trying to diagnose and fix plumbing issues in a house that's that'd be very difficult uh so the barrier to entry for automation is super high um and you're right that those things they're they're not going away people will always need those kinds of services yeah and then the other thing that i would mention is we also have a lot of people who do b2b services that are freelancers and so they're finding these pockets of opportunity they could be a ux designer they could be someone who's a software developer they're Mm. someone who's um, you know, a copywriter and they're able to get gigs and they, they do well out of just, you know, yeah. much less of their calendar than working full time. Although I will say that artificial intelligence is getting scarily good at uh, natural language, at, at writing natural language for copywriting and, and even even software development. Like, did, did I tell you about my AI stuff going on? You did not. No. Oh, do you want to know about that? Sure. I mean, I'm happy to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, just between us. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I, so I, I told you about Open Trellis, and so RVA Works is now within this broader umbrella of Open Trellis, which is learning, lending, investing. Okay. And so, um, you know, you you're all familiar with <clears throat> the genesis of our organization and what we do to help people. And so we also know that access to capital is a big part of that. Um, and so on the lending side, we've been looking at that and saying, gee, there's been this huge disruption in banking, right? Financial services has been disrupted incredibly by payment apps, mobile banking, branchless banking. I mean, there's a long list of dis- different disruptors in financial services and particularly around consumer banking. Mm-hmm. And um, I've been very fortunate to meet with and to um, to start you know, a project with an academic from the UK, um, and she is doing this incredibly important research on artificial intelligence as it relates to loan underwriting. Hmm. And so as we've looked at that, we've said, okay, there is kind of the frontier that we could think of in terms of, of optimizing profitability based on price and volume, right? So, you know, and without getting kind of into the technicalities that aren't particularly entertaining, you know, if we're to say, well, you know, if you're you're lending money, what is the optimal level that you're lending that out at and how much you're charging for interest, right? Right. And how do you mitigate risk? Because risk is obviously a part of that the function. Risk that they don't pay back the loan. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And and so risk is a part of that function. And so she's been looking at those sort of things using AI and large data sets mm-hmm. and looking at secured lending for mortgages. So it's not a great leap 
to a, to apply her research to small business lending, which mm -hmm. is unsecured debt. And our question is probably a little bit different than most conventional for-profit financial institutions because we're looking at it from the perspective of how do we optimize on capital access? So for the people who need funding the most, how do we optimize to reduce our risk, to have the right level of interest that we're charging, and at the same time, to be able to get uh, loans out the door while minimizing our default. Mm -hmm. So, so we're doing we're um, starting to conduct that research. That's super awesome. exciting. Yeah, it, it, it it's got to be difficult to reduce that risk. I think because you said it's unsecured. Like you can't if if a small business takes a loan from you and then they fail and they default, you don't have a house to be like, okay, well, give us your house uh, like a mortgage would. Yeah. Um, so. You, I think there's it's it's kind of like it's a tall order. I mean, to to vet the, these businesses and make sure that your money is going to a good place with good stewardship. Yeah, and 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 the way that I I like to think of this is, let's say that we were to look at banking overall, and then we're to look at the segment in the U.S. You know, I mean, in other countries they have equivalents, but we have community development financial institutions that are formed under the Treasury that are explicitly mandated to provide loan capital and act and you know um, and and other financial services for people in lower income communities mm -hmm. and there is a conventional boilerplate way to underwrite those loans and to mitigate the risk of default and what we're doing is saying okay so how could we augment that enhance that using artificial intelligence to push the frontier to get to the right balance in terms of price volume risk and at the same time getting um, as much capital out the door for the people who need it right right cool very cool so we can get let's go from highbrow <laughs> to lowbrow and talk about how do you uh, think the eagles are going to be <laughs> <laughs> that's super highbrow man <laughs> Well, we are talking about football. So, okay, so so let me let, 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 let me say this. <clears throat> Whenever anybody asks me about the Eagles, I, I have to kind of take it like all the way back. You know, my my first Eagles game, right? I um, that I can remember. I mean, I you know, I remember my aunts and uncles kind of screaming at the television. But the first actual game I can remember was the Fog Bowl. Do you remember mm -hmm. that? I remember. Oh, yeah, yeah, Randall Cunningham. Yep. Do you, you remember? I don't, that? I don't remember you? that. No. Well, was I alive? What year were you born? 93. No, you definitely were not alive. No, I don't remember it. <laughs> yeah. Definitely not. Yeah. Okay. There was a quarterback. His name was Randall Cunningham. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the coach at that time was Buddy Ryan. It was in Chicago. This like thick cloud. You'll have to YouTube it, right? So, you know, this thick cloud of fog rolls in and it totally disrupts the game. It didn't, I mean, didn't they didn't leave. Right? Yeah. I mean, the, the announcers couldn't even see what was going on in the field. Wow. Right. And it's but just it's the NFL. They keep playing. Yeah. They, they keeps don't playing. Yeah. yeah. So, um, wow. so, so, so that's how far back my, um, Eagles time goes. And actually my only Eagles jersey. Oh no, no, that's, that's not true. But my first Eagles jersey, um, and the one that I cherish the most is a 99 Jerome Brown yeah. who was retired. He, yeah, he, that, that jersey, that number was retired for the Philadelphia Eagles. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Norman Brayman was the uh, owner at the time and Reggie White uh, was a teammate. Reggie White was 92, right? These guys were like defensive linemen they were, together. They were amazing. Yeah. They're both really good. Oh, the gangrene defense. Yeah. Right. I mean, it was like unbelievable. <clears throat> um, yeah. It was really unbelievable. But, um, but anyway, uh, the, so the story goes that Reggie White and Norman Brayman are opening the season. They're on stage. And I'm sure Buddy Ryan was there. And at that time, uh, you know, the stadium's packed. I wasn't there that day, although when I was at LaSalle undergrad, I had uh, the opportunity to go to games. I, I, I had like a season ticket, kind of like every home game I was down there. And that's a whole nother crazy story about the 700 level of that stadium. Oh, mm. it's nuts. Oh, yeah. yeah right? I mean, nuts. it's like totally crazy. And so, and, I, and I've, I've been to so many games, it's like they all blur together, but it's like the same sort of thing, right? I mean, it's just like this like crazy aggressive behavior, but it's like, <laughs> it's almost like you, you kind of like want to throw yourself into it. And then afterward, you're like, wow. I'm, I'm glad I didn't throw myself into I'm going to have to, I'm, I'm going to need three days to recover from that, right? Talk about physical austerity. <laughs> 
But this is like Philadelphia. This is what I hear about Philadelphia fans. They have yeah. a magistrate at, at ready to. Uh, yeah, they arraign people yeah. right there, right there in the stadium. Yeah, you go in front of the court right there, um, in 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 the stadium in Lincoln Financial. Wow. Okay. And that was yeah. But anyway, the, but but the point with Reggie White was that he said, and this number will never be worn again. And the team had not decided that they were going to retire the number. At oh, least wow. that that's the story. And that at that time, the whole stadium went nuts because Jerome Brown had died in the offseason in a car accident down in Florida. So here's Reggie White kind of unilaterally retiring the number. Yeah. Everybody went nuts, and they just said, okay, it's never going to be worn again. You're not going to go against Reggie White and the Philly fans, yeah. Yeah, right. right. So that that was This it. was 1999? Uh, oh no! That that uh, that was Jerome Brown. That was Jerome Brown's number was ninety nine. Okay, Jerome yeah. Brown, and he's the one who died in a car accident. Right. And then Reggie White, ninety two. He wore number ninety two. He yeah. basically confidenced his way into t- retiring his number. Yeah, he just said, "That's it. No one's yeah. going to wear it again." So this year, I don't know. I mean, we had a pretty strong draft. I I, I kind of like our chances this year in the in a, uh, you know in the East. I'm I'm feeling positive about that. But see, it's such a weird season, right? There's no training camp. It's so weird. The staff can't evaluate anyone, right? I mean, how's that going to be done now? And 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 there's no preseason games. So I, I think really the losers in this um, are the people who are the players who could have made the 48 man roster had you know had they gone through training camp and you know yep. and that now I guess the coaches are just evaluating it based on tape. And then we start the season. Yeah, weird. It's really weird. But I'm feeling kind of positive. What are you thinking? Philly, Philly is always trying to win the Super Bowl, which is great because a lot of teams in the NFL, frankly, aren't trying. I, I will throw the Bengals under the bus. I don't think they're trying to win. Right. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Buccaneers. The, uh, <laughs> and, well, at, at, at certain parts of their past, but we picked up Brady. We're, we're certainly trying to win oh, yeah, uh, th- true. this coming season. <laughs> I, I We pick up – I'm a Tampa Bay fan. Right. It, we pick up Brady, so of course the season might not happen. <laughs> that, that's the life of a Tampa Bay fan. So I think you have a good enough quarterback. I think your defense is solid. Uh, I, yeah, I, I think your coach is really good. I think you have a chance. And the East, yeah. I think they're the best team in the East coming into the season. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I remember as I was sitting there listening to the draft and watching it unfold, I was thinking, you know, have to strengthen the secondary check, you know, um, I kind of questioned the idea of picking up another quarterback, but, you know, but I mean, it is what it is. I mean, you know, um, I think there's probably way too many people that are armchair quarterbacks, right? I mean, I have my opinion because I watch a lot of games and have for a while, but I've never, you know, been on the inside of any of that. So Mm. I'm just, you know, kind of throwing out. It's fun to be a fan. Yeah, it's fun to be a fan. Yeah. 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 And I love, I mean, you know, I've been actually... One of my proudest things about this is I converted my brother who lives down in uh, out in Northwest Florida. I converted him to an Eagles fan, Robert. Yeah, so so Robert's a big Eagles fan. Probably the closest team to him geographically would be either Jacksonville or New Orleans because yep. they're kind of like right. He lives right near Pensacola in a town called Crestview. And then my son, who's ten years old, that lives that he he's still in Ireland. My, my two children, Fiona and Kean. Um, so both of them are now mandatory Eagles fans and, uh, but it's great when I, you know, when I'm there and usually I'm there in the summer for a couple of weeks and at Christmas for a couple of weeks and there's almost always an Eagles game and, uh, you know, Kean is my son's name. He mm-hmm. is always up for watching an Eagles game. Nice. Super cool. 10 years old. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. His favorite sport, you would think it would be soccer or I don't know, hurling or something. But his favorite sport is basketball. In Ireland. In Ireland, yeah. Fiona too. She was she she was playing a lot of rugby and um Do they have basketball action in Ireland? That you know what? They do. They do. Really? Yeah. He he um he loves playing basketball. The yeah, the National Basketball Arena for Dublin for the Irish team is in is in Dublin as you would imagine. And uh yeah, so there's you know, all the all the national players and he's in his team for their their town. Um, he's you know what? Um, so when I was growing up, um, I was always big for my age, and you know I was kind of like a strong competitor. I was like real hard nosed when I played basketball. 
defense was my game. I boxed out viciously. I leaned on players to wear them down. I was never the tallest guy on the court, but I was just always big. And, you know, I'd get some offensive boards and stuff like that. But I'll tell you the thing about Kean is that he is really fast, really fast. Mm. And um, he ran in the countywide races and placed for that. And he's, he's kind of just a natural athlete. And my daughter is too. I mean, she she does very well. You how know, how old is she? 15. Is, and she plays, you said rugby? <laughs> yeah. There's this picture of her that I love. She has her head down, wrapping up around the legs of this girl. I mean, it's so awesome. Yeah. Rugby. That's yeah. She sounds fierce. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. I mean, I guess, I don't know. I guess it's like in the <laughs> DNA, right? <laughs> Probably. Probably. <laughs> Yeah, but um, do you still play sports, and are you still a fierce competitor? Uh, you know what? Um, so I tore my ACL in my left knee when I was eighteen skiing. Oh, that's uh, brutal. Yeah, and I used to, and before that, I played a lot of football. I loved playing basketball, um, and you know, eventually over time, it just got worse and worse and worse to the point where I couldn't do any lateral movement. So anyone who's had an ACL tear will will know it doesn't really ever get back to what it was and so eventually over time it it just degraded and I, I ended up doing um some some training I didn't play but I um trained a little bit with uh the Greystones Rugby Club in Ireland um and I really enjoyed that I mean it's just like you know real great physical sport and I transitioned over to martial arts so I was always a guy that liked going into the gym and, and staying you know relatively fit you know, when I wasn't kind of out, I don't know, traveling around Europe and <laughs> whatever, yeah. you know, like going in offices and, you know, in the bars. But, uh, you know, but I transitioned over to martial arts and then I stopped doing that a few years ago. And now I just basically, um, you know, get into the gym, get the heart rate up, try to keep the weight down. And that's about it. Nice. Yeah. Very Excellent. cool. Yeah. Well, Dale, this has been a lot of fun, man. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, it's been great to yeah, be man. here with you guys. Thank you so much. All right, dude. Well, we'll, uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right. If you enjoyed this episode, feel free to subscribe through whichever app you're using. To share your thoughts, head over to our website at podso1.io, and there you can comment on episodes or send us feedback directly. Thanks for listening.